this session is the last session of round one. So before I introduce the panelists of this session, let me share with you what we intend to achieve with this last session of, of round one. We want to achieve four things. First, to assess the status and nature of sec national security strategies in Africa. So what is the status? Second, to examine some essential requisites and necessary condition for the, for the successful crafting of national security strategy in Africa. Four, to share the critical phases of national security strategy development process and its core element. And last, discuss key challenges in crafting national security strategy in a complex security environment in Africa. So this preliminary conversation will be for 45 minutes and then followed by a question and answer session. The main reference for this program, as I mentioned in previous session, is the National Security Search Development Toolkit that is now available in English, French, Arabic, and Portuguese. The videos for session one and session two are equally now available. I would like to thank our strategic communication team for doing such a wonderful work. I would like also to thank all those who contributed to the production of the National Security Strategy Development Toolkit that is actually guiding our conversation and this, uh, this program. So let me now introduce the two speakers. I am pleased to welcome two outstanding and seasoned experts on security governance in Africa. We hope they will move our conversation from general concepts and rationale to a practical conversation of how to craft national security strategy in Africa. As you have their bios, I will highlight some of relevant aspects of their expertise and experience. And uh, let me start first with fairly shop with. Although I introduced her when she was moderating session two, let me reintroduce her again as a panelist of this session. She's an independent expert, as I mentioned, in conflict and security with wells of experience in research, policy development, and operation, especially in Africa. She is a rusted expert for the international security sector advisory team. Uh, previously, she worked for Geneva Center for Security Sector Governance, one of, the, uh, one of the leading think tanks in security governance. She hold master degree uh, from the Geneva Graduate Institute and a doctorate from the Otto Sohor Institute of Political Science in Berlin, Germany. We at the Africa Center benefit from her expertise by thoroughly and thoughtfully reviewing and revising the National Security Toolkit that you have. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Feli, and for your, your input and the revision of the, of the toolkit. So we're lucky having her with us with such experience. The second panelist, maybe I need to introduce him, maybe some of the discussion group, you might have met him, but let me, I met first Victor Emil when I attended the senior leaders in security uh, workshop organized by Africa Center. By then, Victor Emil was a, a facilitator and I attended, I was in his discussion group. Victor Emil, uh, Emil Odrago, uh, Victor Emil has exceptional and rare experience in security issues in Africa. He was an officer a parliamentarian at national and regional level, a minister of national security, a scholar with his research, research paper entitled Advancing Military Professionals in Africa. Please visit our, our website. It's one of the most cited and read uh, research product of the Africa Center. And also he is actually a practitioner with his foundation um, uh, called Citizen Security in Burkina Faso. 
He is currently an adjunct professor of practice at the Africa Center and has been engaged with Africa Center since 2007. And he compiled various case studies on national security strategy in Africa that provide the basis for the national security strategy uh, development toolkit. And, and he played a significant role in the drafting of the toolkit. And he was also a member of scientific committee that guided the national security strategy policy in Burkina Faso. Uh, so we are really lucky uh, having Emil. Uh, he earned his PhD from the Center for Diplomatic and Strategic Studies in Paris, France. Uh, so we are really lucky having uh, Dr. Emil Odrago uh, with us today to share with us his wealth of experience and expertise. So let me now share the conversation first with, um, with uh, Dr. Feli. My first question, given your experience with the DCAV and a thorough review of our toolkit, the National Security Study Development Toolkit. Can you share with the participants the necessary conditions and phases for successful crafting of national security strategy in Africa? Shepo, um, um, you, you are most welcome. Thank you, uh, Dr. Luca, for the question and the introduction. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, um, wherever you are. Yeah, um, the remarks I have to make are um, basically the fruit of a lot of attention that we have paid to how these processes work across contexts. So while every, every case is different and every country needs to adapt its own process, at the same time, there are um, elements of the process that seem to be quite typical and that we find again and again. Some of that has to do with context. So we've looked at, for example, we've talked about before how uh, national security strategies can be really relevant um, as a blueprint for change and adaptation of the security sector. And that may be under external conditions, for example, with the AU policy framework or following a conflict situation, or it may be without the presence of external actors or um, without conflict in a, in a context. At the same time, um, we've seen that national security sector development can be a security sector strategy development can be especially useful um, in situations either of conflict or post-conflict where details of the security arrangements in a transition context may not have been agreed at the level, for example, of a peace agreement. And so it facilitates the broader conversation that may include more stakeholders a more public discussion and may get to a level of detail that uh, may not have otherwise been the case. And, in that, and it can have a de-escalating effect in, in those types of contexts. At the same time, um, we've seen that uh, national security strategy policy and development is, is necessary to respond to changes in the security environment. These may be internal if there are parts of a country that are facing new security challenges or parts of a population perhaps whose security is not fully taken into account. These are the types of changes that may trigger a, a change in policy and therefore a new security strategy. But ultimately, I think um, it's really important to, to recall the points that we heard from last week, whereas national security strategy, policymaking and development is a natural and normal part of democratic politics, um, whether it's in transitions and, st and the stabilization of a new democracy or just the revival and the renewal of security policy in an existing democracy. National security strategies serve the purpose of signaling intentions, we had heard this last week, but also of prioritizing resources and aligning the national security goals, the public safety goals of a nation with other national development goals, such as sustainable development or other national priorities. Now, if those, those are sort of a, that's a wide range of context wherein a national security strategy may be developed, but the way in which such a policy and strategy can be developed um, has a few phases that we've identified. And this is what you'll find also in the toolkit. So um, basically we've, uh, we've identified seven phases that we see. Um, these are summarized in figure one of the toolkits that you have in all of the translations. And the first process, the first step in these 
in this process, the first phase, is planning. And as, the, as we say, fail to plan is the same as planning to fail. And this is true also of national security strategy development. There needs to be a careful um, moment at the beginning of the process where the entire process itself is planned. That means whoever is initiating the process um, needs to appoint someone to lead the process and to manage it. That means figuring out budgets, timelines, roles and responsibilities, stakeholders, identifying a plan for consultation, for example, and then critically appointing a drafting committee or someone who will actually write the text. And that is a point whereby it allows you to move to the second stage, so phase two, and that's what we call pre-drafting. So if we take um, Professor Tadesi's observation that a national security strategy is like a compass for national security, then the pre-drafting stage is the part where we figure out where we are right now. What is the starting point? What is the status quo? So this is the point where whoever is going to be writing the text of the national security strategy goes through the process of gathering all of the information that they need to be able to figure out what to do. So what is the existing uh, status of the security sector? What are its capabilities? Um, this is where we do security sector assessments, threat assessments, also consultations. They may be public, they may be formal, they may be informal, but they're about, it's about getting a clear sense of what the um, society feels is important, what the threats are. Once the uh, drafting committee has at its disposal all the information that it needs, um, it can move to the third stage. And this is what we call then drafting. This is where you come up with the text, the zero draft. And there are different um, elements of this. You'll find um, some inputs in the toolkits in figure four, um, which is about uh, steps in the drafting process. And then also box number six, which outlines elements that a typical strategy involves in terms of text. This usually involves defining what is meant by security. This seems like a simple step, but establishing that common language is really important in order to be able to arrive at a national vision. And that's the next part. National vision based on shared values, um, a, a accounting of the interests, national interests, and the threats that have to be met, and a set of objectives which have been prioritized. Prioritizing objectives is really critical because the national security strategy also has to assign roles and responsibilities within the security sector in order to respond to those priorities. And that last part is essential because the national security strategy has to be not only a document that embodies a national vision, but it has to be a practical tool for changing the way the security sector works um, in response to threats that have been defined at the highest level. So once the drafting committee arrives at that stage um, and has a first draft, can move to then what we call the fourth phase, which is a phase of review and consultation. Um, you'll see some details about how consultation can work in figure six of your toolkits. Um, Consultation and review has to involve all of the stakeholders across government and the security sector and those who will be involved in implementation, but it should also at this stage involve public consultation. So this is where you can call on the expertise of civil society experts, civilian experts, um, representative groups, people who represent more generally the social response to national security and public safety. And then on the basis of that feedback, that that which is constructive needs to be reworked into the draft to arrive at a final version. Once there's a final version, we arrive at phase five, which is adoption and approval. So on the one hand, whoever has initiated the process, and that will vary by legal context, um, will then be involved in adopting it and approving it. But there's also a role here for parliaments and the role of parliaments really differs according to process. Sometimes um, there's no legal requirement to involve parliament at all, but it's usually a good idea to involve parliament in some way, whether by um, whether parliament has initiated the strategy or not, because it increases the legitimacy of the national security strategy. And also at some point in implementation, even if parliaments are not called on to explicitly adopt and approve a strategy, they're usually involved in resource allocation and later on in um, 
accountability and oversight of implementation processes. So involving Parliament in the elaboration of the strategy and then its adoption and approval is a way of gaining legitimacy that will help with implementation further along in the process. Um, and then so finally, assuming that you have a national security strategy that is um, well developed, adopted and approved, you're not yet finished, we have a sixth phase, which is about communicating and disseminating this policy. Now, we not it's all of the stakeholders in government who need to realign their work plans and develop sectoral strategies in order to implement the policy actually need to have access to it. And at the same time, this is an opportunity for a public outreach campaign that will communicate national vision and priorities and through engagement with the media, help build public support and the legitimacy of a national security strategy, which actually improves the effect effectiveness of the strategy in some ways because it increases public, uh, public confidence in the role of the security sector to perform the missions that they've been assigned right, in an ideal scenario. And then finally, um, on the basis of all this work, you can arrive at the final stage, which is implementing the policy. Now, this is, this is a space that may last a very, very long time since uh, national security strategies can last for several years. But this implementation, implementation stage should not be neglected because it also needs to include a, a process of monitoring and review. So a policy that has no impact is not very worthwhile. Instead, we need to track what it's doing, what influence it's having. And this is where it's useful to note that a national security strategy development process is not a straight line that happens once, phases one to seven, it's actually a circle that goes around and around again and again, because the what we learn from the measurement and evaluation of, a, of the implementation of the policy and strategy should feed back into process planning and when the need to review the strategy comes around again at some point. So that's um, kind of brief but long overview of the phases that we found in our toolkit. There's more details on all of this um, and the translations that you've been provided. Um, Dr. Luca? Oh, oh, thank you very much, Dr. Chopelli. Thank you very much for, for highlighting those phases and the context. And I think this question came out in the last session, whether it is for the uh, conflict areas, but I think you are saying it's for different conditions. Maybe, Dr. Chopelli, if you could just highlight briefly the main elements after the document itself, how the document look like, and what are the key elements. It is true, as you rightly put it, it differs from context to another. But maybe share with the participant the key elements of this of this document. Sure. Um, so there's a really uh, helpful summary of this on I think it's uh, box six of the toolkits and all the translations. Um, and essentially, there are some parts of. Uh, of a, of a strategy, I mean, we've had a discussion about strategy and policy and, and what the definition is. Here we're using the word national security strategy to include the idea of the policy part and the strategy part. Um, and that means what it includes is is part of what makes for a useful process and, and helps increase the, the likelihood of a consensus that is, that is going to provide a good basis for implementation. On the basis of this kind of um, what might seem like vague things, we can arrive at a, a really a more concrete vision of national security. strategy is going to be a key tool in breaking those um, 
those deadlocks where everything seems important. So prioritization is a really important aspect of implementation later on. And then finally, once there's this prioritization of, of threats and responses, there needs to be a division of labor established for the security sector. Which parts of the security sector, who exactly is going to be responsible for doing what? And this is um, also a key aspect of making what is a values-based document into a practical basis from Um, and also conflicts and roles and responsibilities, um, the overlaps, the, the um, ambig ambiguities, which can cause real problems in security sector governance um, on the ground on a day-to-day -day basis. So those are some of the elements that are, that are really important um, across strategies that we've seen to work well. Well, oh, thank you very much, uh, Fairly. I think just for the participant, all these things, what Fairly is sharing with us, that in the, in the toolkit, and that's why it's a reference point very practical, these are the things. Um, as, as fairly mentioned, this is the context differs. You can tailor them and to the context. Maybe the last question fairly is the, um, what are, definitely is a very bumpy process. It's not an easy process. And what are some of the common challenges that are commonly encountered in drafting national security strategy and how to overcome such, such challenges? Sure. So it is indeed, it can indeed be a bumpy process, but the process itself can be a way of addressing many of these challenges, um, which are often not so much technical challenges as political challenges, problems of trust, problems of experience, really more interpersonal challenges. So section three of the toolkit um, looks in more detail at some of these aspects. One of the things that we see often is um, where countries perhaps um, have a tumultuous history, often the security sector has been involved in um, periods of abuse, there may be legacies of hurt and trauma there that can make it very difficult to build up the kind of um, trust in the security sector, trust in the state that a population needs um, in order to feel safe and that a, a security sector and a government needs in order to provide national security and public safety. Going through a process of national security strategy development that has a public outreach component that seeks to reach the public, educate, share, and work in, and, and discuss values and objectives in a transparent manner can be a way of helping to, to address legacies of abuse and, and building up a new trust, which can be a new foundation um, for moving forward. Uh, Secrecy, cultures of secrecy within the security sector has often been a problem um, in the sense that there may be a lingering feeling as much among security personnel as civilian personnel and the general population that security is a taboo subject, that it's something that only um, you know, high level experts or politicians in uniforms should address and that um, it may even be difficult or dangerous to talk about. And that is unfortunately not a very helpful attitude, but the best way to address it is again to seek a broader, more consultative process that is more transparent. Some people worry that uh, this can be, um, this can compromise a process where sensitive matters are being discussed. But for a start, um, Definitions of security, discussions of national values, national priorities are not things that need to be secret. So the high level discussion of national security strategy development um, and in its public aspects does not require um, the kind of secrecy that might um, endanger security operations or in that respect. So that's one aspect of it. Another aspect of it is that it is, act it is um, in a democratic context uh, it should indeed be the public representatives and the society itself that's that decides what objectives for security provision should be, whilst the technical and professional expertise of the security sector are brought to bear on the question of how to implement those goals and reach those objectives. So that conversation of mutual respect is something that's really important to establish anyway. And then besides that, there are also processes on the technical side, such as classification schedules and um, mechanisms for managing information access, which can ensure that what is sensitive and, and, and correctly um, 
classified in a national security strategy making process remains so, whilst ensuring that a public discussion about values and objectives um, can usefully take place. And part of this also within the process itself, perhaps less involving the public aspect, but more involving people who are actually involved in decision making, there may be important knowledge gaps between um, different stakeholders in the process, especially if, um, and this is desirable, you have a drafting committee, which involves a broad range of representative participants. So people coming from both civilian and security backgrounds with representing different points of view. Um, knowledge gaps between people involved in the process can be overcome um, through external expertise, through technical workshops, and it can really help establish a common language amongst those who are holding these discussions, uh, which again arrives at a more useful uh, document and a, and a shared vision that can be a useful platform for moving forward. And then finally, um, one, of the, one of the sort of challenges of national security strategy development in particular in SSR context is just establishing, um, uh, establishing a basis for cooperation, not only at a national level, but with external actors as well. So in SSR context, for example, or externally assisted context, there may be many offers of support coming from many different directions. And if there is not a coherent national strategy in place to um, that establishes national priorities, there is a real danger of distraction and even projects that work at cross purposes. Um, so that's uh, another sort of challenge for developing policy that a good strategy can help overcome. Oh, oh thank you very much, Dr. Fred. That's an excellent work. I mean, you have really summarized how many pages of the toolkit in a few minutes. So thank you very much. And uh, I think that's a very good, a very good operationalization of what we have been talking about. Maybe now let me move to Dr. Emil. Emil, I know you have compiled many case studies uh, early before we, we embark on this program on national security strategy development to understand what is really happening on the continent. So based on these case studies and your experience uh, working with the African Union, what are you seeing? What, what is the status of national security strategy in Africa? and uh, uh, in terms of like some of the issues that uh, mentioned by Dr. Fairley. Um, uh, please, yes, welcome, Dr. Emil. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Luca. And hello to everyone, or good evening, wherever you might be. First off, I would like to thank the Africa Center for Strategic Studies to give me this opportunity to, to work with uh, experts in the field, Dr. Luca and, and General Balasali, Colonel Dimitran. And uh, we did some case studies in, uh, from March to June of 2018. And we worked in, and we had case studies on national security strategies. And I, there was a South Africa, Senegal, Botswana, Nigeria, Liberia, Ivory Coast, Mali, Burkina Faso, Madagascar, and South Sudan, where we had the case studies. And it was the first time this took place. It was sort of an exploratory study. And they were uh, based, it gave us a chance to see the situation on the ground in Africa. And this really helped us uh, in f future seminars. What I, uh, the takeaway from these studies, the most important point I feel, it's that the studies reveal that in all the countries, many countries, there are certain strategies, some have strategies, security strategies. However, they do not have a, a written document that clearly shows how, what the architecture of this national security strategy is. And so therefore there are, most of the countries had uh, policies, defense policies, and within those policies, there was the national security strategy of the country. 
so the we were able to slowly explain that there's a fundamental difference between a defense policy and a national security strategy so all of the countries had defense national defense policies but but they did not have uh, documents that of national security strategies that were written so in terms of a defense policy uh we they were mostly of course a military perspective the ministries of defense had uh, written up and who who had put these documents together so we needed to have a new orientation uh, to include they were they, to include the population because in the past they had not so we they were mostly interested in uh, national sovereignty protection of of the country the the land and it also we also learned as as mentioned that that the um, there was the issue of the secret uh, and keeping much of the information secret, but it and the question was how to to maintain the necessary secrets, but not not overly not overly uh, classified too much. So. But much of these um, put to the side um, the civilians and did not include them. They did not consult civilians in this policy. So we had uh, defense policies in Africa that did not include that aspect. And defending a country militarily has nothing to do with a general uh, national security strategy. So, of course, for African countries, we needed to have a coherent national security strategy developed. And that is the situation that we uh, found based on our case studies in 2018 that uh, with the help of the Africa Center. Thank you, Dr. Luca. Well, well, thank you very much, Emil, for such an elaborate uh, um, account of the gaps that we are seeing on the continent. Why countries do not have the national security strategy and they do have sectoral uh, security uh, strategies. Um, let me move on to the, um, to build on what uh, Dr. Fairley uh, mentioned about the faces of the uh, national security uh, strategy development or policy development. But based on your experience, especially in Burkina Faso, especially the faces, and it would be good if you can shed some lights, especially how you come to the consensus around defining the national security, uh, national security, national security um, uh, generally. So if you can just build on what fairly talk about the faces, so a practical example of Burkina Faso, what faces? And, and it would be good also for you to tell us what was the entry point? How did you start? Came from where? <laughs> and, and, and then tell us about the faces so that you can be able to. to. So please share mm -hmm. with us the experience of Burkina Faso. And by the way, to the participant is one of the cases with you in the, uh, in the reading material that you have. Uh, Dr. Emil. Okay, merci beaucoup, doctor. Thank you so much, Dr. Luca and Dr. Fairley for having uh, prepared this terrain for me. Yes, I worked on the development that uh, Dr. Luca spoke of, and I also contributed uh, to the uh, development in Madagascar of a national security strategy and of Burkina Faso also. I was a part of the uh, Committee of the Development of the Security Strategy. Dr. Fairley has covered all the points very well, the basic elements of the different phases 
And it's exactly what we need to do to put in place a national security strategy. But in terms of what Dr. Luca said, it's we have to uh, we have to in terms of what the doctor said, we have to think of the um, specificity of each context. Each context is different. And Dr. Fairley spoke of the importance of the context that is a, a fundamental aspect of this development. So the first point that Dr. Luca mentioned was um, th the start. How do you elaborate? How do you begin? Most of the countries that have not known uh, terrible crises that are fairly stable, uh, they still needed to harmonize their policies uh, the, of the different sectors. And so the question is, where does one begin to start this process? As Dr. Tadis mentioned and before me and Dr. Fairley, there are at least a different, different doorways to begin. First of all, you have the countries that are post-conflict. This has very much influenced the drafting of the policy of the African unit Union on national on security strategies on the uh, and also the United Nations and th this package this approach this doorway of post conflict countries currently and the reforms of security strategies encourage countries post-conflict to go towards, they, it encourages them to develop a national security strategy. This is the first point and the first, and then other countries like Burkina Faso who have had a security and political crises, perhaps not conflicts, but they've had coup d'etat, terrorism. So they have very complex security situations. And in this kind of situation, Burkina therefore uh, pulled together a national forum on security. And this was very important for countries like Mali and Niger also. So I it strongly recommended to have a national security strategy. And then you have the countries that are fairly stable that have not yet uh, gone through terrible crises. Um, they, they are, you know, have democratic governments um, and in national, they have parliaments and they can put together a national security strategy they, but they realize sometimes that they are not meeting the security needs of the people and therefore they need to develop a strategy that includes that. It has to be more inclusive. And so the way forward, the doorway one chooses is very important. Once a, a program has been initiated, once it's been initiated, it's important to um, to to elaborate the policy. So it's the initiation that starts the 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 elaboration of a policy. But it's so important that the organization that is going to uh, draft this policy. Uh, must be uh, well chosen and must be well established. The organizations must be institutions that are uh, well established because if it has to be well anchored, 
um, within an institution fairly mentioned it already. Um, the, there's a question of knowledge and expertise in Burkina, sometimes there's a lack of it. And in Burkina, we were able to have a government seminar and we asked what to ask all of the ministers to be able to explain to them what is a national security strategy. So everyone was on the same level and understanding. Another important part to stabilize a national security strategy, we spoke of the uh, particularities of context of, and in the Anglophone countries, they have, they are already, they already have a basic architecture for national security strategy, but in the French speaking countries, they do not. In the Francophone countries, they don't have this anchor for national security strategy. So it's a little more complica complicated to initiate these, um, this development because you might have conflicts of leadership, as, the, que the question arises, who is going to uh, be um, in charge of this process? And this is why we encourage um, a scientific committee. This is very important. And we found that in Burkina, it was very helpful. It allowed us to um, ad move ahead very quickly to uh, essential phases of the program. So I'm going to stop there because surely there will be questions and we'll come back to it. But before ending, I will, I will come back to the question of resources. If you don't, if you don't have a good plan in place, you really need to have a good plan for the proper use of the resources. So otherwise, you're going to be going back and forth constantly and not making any progress. So I will stop now, and I'm sure that there will be further questions upon this, which I'll be glad to answer. Thank you. Yeah, Victor Emil. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I think you, you have provided a good, a good, a good context and build on uh, what Victor Feli uh, mentioned about the faces and the and the context specificity for each. Uh, for each country in developing such a strategy. Maybe just if you can highlight briefly because we are left with some few minutes, the challenges and uh, like what fairly Bill on what fairly, um, Victor fairly said, the challenges that, that usually you can encounter during crafting the national security strategy and, and the best way of overcoming such of these challenges. Yes, Bill on what he, he said as well. Okay. Uh, merci, merci. Yeah. Dr. Thank you, Dr. Luca. I think uh, in terms of what Dr. Fairley said, she mentioned uh, this problem, but in the practical phase, the biggest challenge is uh, knowing what we're going to do. It seems obvious, but Dr. Fairley talked about the concepts and congratulations to the Africa Center to to, to, to first off speak of definitions. It seems uh, mundane, but it is so important. If you want a national security strategy, you want a national security policy, you want a national security policy of defense, I, between these three concepts, uh, we spent three months in Burkina Faso to, to understand that we needed a national security policy and therefore we were able to offer this to the government and they accepted it. And this, is the, this was the importance of the scientific committee. And if you if you try to skip over this phase to understand the definition of these terms, or if, and if you want to go for, from a military centered strategy to a population centered, centered strategy, uh, without doing that, it will be terrible. And uh, let's look at, of course, the example of the, uh, the COVID pandemic 
we have seen that a country can can be devastated without a this strategy in place. So in terms of what Dr. Raymond said, how he defined national security strategy, it it's good. To, he said that national security is knowing how to secure and the nation. And it is not just the military. There are many more other aspects to this that can there is health, economy, the economy. We need there are so many different elements one must address to assure the safety and security of a nation. And the also the idea of consensus, uh, Dr. Fairley spoke of this, this is very important. All of this development of a national security, if you don't have cons consensus, it will not happen. She said it's like a cycle. It's a permanent cycle. It's a permanent circle. So the scientific committee can from time to time, if there is no consensus, can um, make have uh, additional uh, complementary studies and come back as a mo moderator conciliatory role. So consensus mm, is important. It must include inclusivity. It's very important. And perhaps we will come back to that, um, to these concepts for uh, in the planning of these strategies that Dr. Fairley developed so well.